Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, Baumic Lecture and Colloquium. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Lisa Randall. She's the Frank Baird Professor of Science at Harvard. She's one of the world's leaders in particle theory. Her fame exploded with her paper on large, large mass hierarchy from small extra dimensions. And this was a very novel solution to one of the big problems in uh, theoretical particle physics. Uh, she's worked on many topics. That includes extra dimensions, supersymmetry, cosmology, baryogenesis, grand unified theories, and so forth. Uh, she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, also the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She won the Lilienfeld Prize for, from the APS, and I think many of you know her from her books. Uh, her, her, uh, one of her books uh, is uh, Warp Passages. That was her first book. Unraveling the Mysteries of the Universe, uh, the Universe's Hidden, sim uh, hidden Dimensions. Uh, second book, Knocking on Heaven's Door, How Physics and Scientific Thinking Illuminate the Universe and the Modern World. And then uh, the book that's connected to what she's uh, telling us about today is uh, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, which is one hell of a good title. Uh, anyway, you should go out and buy her books if you don't have them. Uh, anyway, without further ado, I give you Lisa Randall, who's going to tell us about Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm getting an echo. Is it okay for you? Okay. Okay, good. So I'm also getting a phone call. Um, <laughs> so, um, are we okay now? Um, it's very nice to meet with a lot of you today and to speak to this group that uh, um, at least a lot of the people I talk to range from astrophysicists uh, to particle physicists to gravity people. So it's really nice range and breath here. And no one can hear me, is that right? Yeah. Anyway, I just said nice things, but we should probably raise the volume so you can hear the talk. Can you hear me now? Okay. All right, I just said nice things, you can ignore that. Okay, all right, okay. So I'm gonna tell you today, um, just kind of give you an overview about dark matter. I'm not gonna go into too many details about the ways we know about dark matter. I'll say it very briefly. I'll assume that we do have some idea about that. And I'll talk about um, our quest to find out what dark matter actually is, okay? And this is work with, I've done with a number of great postdocs and students. Um, or I mentioned, some of whom are mentioned here and some of whom will come up throughout the talk. But these names are here in case I forget to say them later, which I probably will. Okay. So I don't think anyone here doesn't know that um, the makeup of the universe poses some mysteries. Um, the part that we really understand, the part that applies with particle physics um, that we've studied, um, is the part labeled here as atoms, which is roughly 5%. Um, it's, even, even for that part, we don't fully understand it because there is a big question of why there's more matter than antimatter, um, which is why there are atoms around, left around at all. So that even that's an interesting question. But the other two are in some respects even more mysterious because we don't know what they're made of in the sense that we know that about five times as much of the energy of the universe is carried by this matter we call dark matter. It's a really terrible name in the sense that it's not dark. The defining feature of dark matter is that it doesn't interact with light at all. That is to say, it doesn't emit or absorb light. Um, so as far as we know, it has none of the standard model interactions, but it does interact with gravity. And so and it interacts with gravity like matter. So we know, th and that's why we call it dark matter, because it is matter. Um, on top of that, of course, there's also dark energy, which is responsible for the um, acceleration of the expansion of the universe. Um, in some sense, the mysterious thing about that is why it's as small as it is, not just what, what it is, is it, but why it's as small as it is. Um, dark matter, now dark energy is almost by definition uniform throughout time and, and space. Um, it probably isn't actually uniform in time, but that is kind of what it is. What, what, the reason dark matter is interesting is that it actually, like ordinary matter, it clumps. Um, it clumps into galaxies, it clumps into structure. 
So the, my hope is that by really studying in detail um, the properties of the universe, we can actually learn more about the properties of dark matter. So there's, a, and I think we're, this is a pretty interesting time in the sense that um, there's a lot more ideas about what dark matter can be, but there's also a lot more astronomical measurements out there that might shed some light on it. And I'll try to give you a flavor of why I think that's the case during this talk. Okay, so um, we have a great cosmological model, but it does leave these critical questions unanswered, which is really the nature of the matter and energy of the universe. Um, now, you know, so, some people get very upset by this. So you know, you'll think people like, come on, people have been looking for dark matter for so long, how come they haven't found it? Well, it's almost by definition hard to find, right? We're saying that it does, it does as far as we know, it's not interacting via the standard forces which is how we generally discover things via their interactions, such as with light. Um, so if it doesn't interact with light, we have to be really clever. Now, of course, as I'll explain, there, there is a hope that it interacts weakly with light at some level so that we can still find it. But it is a challenge to see something that interacts. If it turns out it interacts only gravitationally, then all we can look for are gravitational influences, which is the kind of thing that we found. So, um, we literally can't see things that interact only gravitationally. So how have we discovered dark matter so far? How has it been observed? Well, the thing that often gets missed when people, when you see articles like, you know, it's not really dark matter, it's some modification or something, is that there are just many different ways that we have observed dark matter, and they are all consistent. Um, people, have, most of you probably have heard about galactic rotation curves, the fact that, um, in the galaxy, stars are rotating faster than can be accounted for by the visible matter. And a similar thing applies in galaxy clusters where galaxies themselves are moving faster than can be accounted for by visible matter. But there's also more direct probes in some sense of how it's distributed in terms of gravitational lensing. Um, the idea that even if something is dark, it can exert gravitational influence. So even though if, some, if dark matter itself doesn't interact with light, if there is something that interacts with light, it would bend around the dark matter. And this is a way you can probe the distribution of dark matter in the universe. Um, a very direct piece of evidence for dark matter is something called the bullet cluster and other clusters that are like it. Um, those are objects that are consist, the clusters consist of dark matter, stars, and gas. And when they pass through each other, the gas will experience friction and get stuck in the middle whereas the dark matter goes through. And you actually can observe these, and you can see the gas, and you can use gravitational lensing to see that the dark matter has passed through. And I find this really important because it's very hard to modify the laws of gravity so that it would do this. This is exactly what you would expect if there is dark matter in the universe. Um, there's other ways, the measurements that found the acceleration and expansion of the universe, the first measurements, supernova. Um, actually also had to establish that there was dark matter before they could establish there was dark energy. But actually, the last three are in some ways perhaps the best evidence that there's dark matter. Um, just the fact that we're here today, the existence of galaxies that were formed during the lifetime of the universe, and the existence of galaxies on the scale of the Milky Way, is evidence that there is more matter in the universe than just visible matter. If there had been only visible matter, there wouldn't have been enough time since matter overtook radiation as the dominant source of energy in the universe for a structure to form. On top of that, if it had interacted with light, it would have washed away structure on the scale of the galaxy. So really, it's not often stated, but just the existence of structure in the lifetime of the universe is in many ways evidence for dark matter. And the cosmic microwave background radiation is really a detailed probe of the universe, of the earlier universe. And in it, when you look at density fluctuations, density perturbations, you see competing effects of dark matter, which drives, um, which is attractive and drives structure, and radiation, which sort of drives structure out. And you actually see peaks and troughs that correspond to this competition. So it's again, very direct evidence for dark matter. So when you hear about modified gravity and other theories, um, you should challenge those people to explain all these other things. The one thing that they, try to get its rotation curves and they don't even necessarily succeed in that. But it's very hard to explain all these different pieces of evidence that are consistent that seem to really drive us to think there is dark matter in the universe.
So I will accept the fact that there's dark matter. There's a lot of evidence, it's all consistent. And it's basically how we establish the existence of new phenomena. But of course, there's still an outstanding question for many of us, which is, what is it? Um, so we know it's something that interacts gravitationally. We know how much energy density it carries. We know something, not enough, about its distribution. But what is it? Is it made up of elementary particles the way our matter is? is? Um, if it is made up of particles, what's the mass of that particle? What are the interactions of that particle? Is it just one type of particle, or are there different ones? I mean, these seem like pretty obvious questions, but we don't know the answer to them. And what I'm going to try to argue is that we can at least try to make progress in understanding that by studying its structure in more detail. So we know only of the gravitational interactions, but there's no other discernible interactions yet. So I say the existence of dark matter is not necessarily so mysterious. After all, why should all matter in the universe be similar to ours? There's no reason that we necessarily are defining what all the matter is. But the makeup of the matter still is mysterious. We don't know what it is. So how do we find it? Well, in some sense, a lot of attention has, been gone, has gone to looking under the lamppost. Um, of course, you have to know what are the right lampposts. Um, and in the end of the day, I think we have to be, consider more broadly the possibilities. Um, and could it interact really differently from matter we're familiar with? Um, so I'm going to tell you about some new ideas. I'm not going to say any one of them are, are necessarily correct. But I think we should consider a broad spectrum of ideas about what dark matter can be. But like I said, mostly people have looked under the lamppost so far. And the way they've done that is something called, I would say, is WIMPs, which, are, which stands for weakly interacting massive particles, although it turns out it interacts far more weakly than the weak force that we know of in the standard model. And I'd say until recently, and maybe still today, it's the most popular candidate. And it might turn out to be right, but there's no experimental evidence for it yet. So what are the merits? The merits of this are that it occurs in extensions of the standard model. It involves scales of physics that we know occur. Basically, it's a particle of mass about the same as the Higgs boson mass that interacts with interactions set by that scale. The other merit is that it's testable because it's not only gravitational interactions. If it's not only gravitational interactions, it means you have a chance to actually see it in a laboratory experiment based on standard model interactions. Um, the arguments against it are that it hasn't been seen. Not only has, has dark matter not been seen, no evidence for physics beyond the standard model at the scale of the Higgs boson has been seen yet, which is quite worrisome. And so I would argue that it might be correct, but it certainly has been overhyped and overaccepted, and we should be considering other possibilities. Let me just very briefly tell you how we've looked for dark matter, for those, since this is a colloquium, I'll give a very brief review. But the idea is that even though it's interacting weakly, it's not interacting nearly as weakly as just purely gravitational. The idea is that there is some interaction with standard model particles, um, enough to explain its density in the universe. I should say another merit of it is that it naturally, if it is, does have a mass of about the Higgs boson mass, it naturally explains why the energy density is about the right amount to account for dark matter. That's just a simple calculation following the thermal universe. Um, so you can look for the probability, um, you can look for these low probability events by looking for a small nuclear recoil of dark matter off protons or even electrons. Um, so, and, that, and the idea is to build these experiments as big as possible so that you have a better chance of seeing these things. So the big, even if it's low probability, you multiply by enough chances, then you have a chance of seeing it. And so right now we live in an era where we're making, where this is xenon 100, you can see this was an old slide, you know, xenon 1 ton, and we're just getting bigger and bigger and looking better and better. But we still haven't found it. Um, another experimental lamppost that you might have heard of is the Large Hadron Collider. Again, if it's weak scale mass, um, it would have about the right energy density to constitute dark matter. Um, and such a particle can occur in basically any extension of the standard model. And we think there are extensions of the standard model with particles around the mass of the Higgs boson, 
because the theory almost seems inconsistent without it. There's no explanation for why the Higgs boson mass is what it is. So um, really, any stable weak scale particle can be a candidate. But again, we haven't seen anything beyond the standard model at the LHC. And the other way, um, and some really interesting work is being done here on that too, is um, indirect searches. The idea that um, a supersymmetric particle, sorry, this says supersymmetric particles here, but just a dark matter particle could find another dark matter particle and annihilate to visible matter, which can be detected. Now, of course, there's lots of visible matter in the universe, so you want to find something that, that's distinctive. So a lot of these searches are based on antiparticle searches. Um, of course, there are also antiparticles in the universe, so you have to find something that's sufficiently uncommon or has a sufficiently different distribution that you can find it. So looking for antiparticles or photons is one way to study it. And there's a very interesting experiment um, being led here that looks for antideuterons, which could be a very interesting candidate. Okay. So I'd say that these searches, so you often hear about these three ways of searching for dark matter. But I hope I, that it's clear to you that these are three ways of searching for WIMPs. All of those searches require some interaction with standard model particles well beyond gravitational. So these searches aren't searches for dark matter in general. They're searches for WIMPs. So the WIMP is a standard paradigm, but so far we haven't seen it. So we still don't know what it is. So it's certainly time to think about different types of models. And the field is wide open. We really don't know what it is. But, and the problem is that for many of the candidates, it's going to be really hard to see it, to really know about it. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of possibilities where you might, um, in some cases, have chances of observing it and in the process learn a lot of interesting physics, okay? So before I do that, I just want to mention one other really interesting possibility, I think, which is um, thinking that dark matter, this is asymmetric dark matter. I, I, the talk was titled uh, New Models of Dark Matter. So I just want to mention this because I think it is a really interesting possibility. Um, to think that maybe matter and dark matter are more similar than we usually think. And if, remember I said at the beginning that there's an interesting mystery about matter, which is why it's here at all. If there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the universe, it would have basically annihilated away to nothing, so we wouldn't be here today. It would be exponentially suppressed at the temperatures that we're at today. Yet, here we are. So that's strong evidence that there is more in matter than antimatter. Maybe with dark matter it's very similar. And maybe, maybe the fact that, and the reason this isn't such a crazy idea is that the amount of dark matter is about five times the amount of ordinary matter. That's actually remarkably similar. I mean, it could have been 10 trillion times bigger or smaller. The fact that they're so similar is some evidence that maybe there is a connection. I don't know if there really is, but maybe there is. And that connection could be there's some interaction in the early universe, there's a common chemical potential, related chemical potentials, and the amount of energy density in dark matter would then be about the same as the amount of energy density in matter. So I'm not gonna go into any of the details, but I think it is important to realize in those cases, if they are interacting, chemical potentials would be related, the number densities would be related, and depending on what the mass is, you would find something that corresponds to about comparable uh, energy densities for ranges of masses, a few GeV to 100 GeV. Okay. So what are some other interesting possibilities? Well. Another interesting possibility that's been largely unexplored, it's, it's started to get more attention, is that maybe dark matter in some sense isn't so different from ordinary matter in the sense that it too has interesting structure, it too has interactions. Maybe just the same way ordinary matter interacts via standard model forces that dark matter doesn't experience, maybe dark matter interacts via forces that ordinary matter doesn't experience. Um, we have no idea whether or not that's the case. So we should look, turn to experimental evidence for that, and observational evidence, and see whether or not it's the case. And when I first started working on this, um, I thought there were strong constraints on how much dark matter can interact. And indeed they're strong, but actually it, um, looking at it in detail with some of the postdocs I worked with, 
I would argue that in many cases, we really don't know what those constraints are, and a lot more work has to be done. I mean, it's absolutely clear that if dark matter had its own interactions, it would affect its distribution. But being able to say this is ruled out or not ruled out is a much more subtle thing that depends a lot on what your initial distributions are and what the, how those interactions work. So let me just give you some idea. Okay. So in particular, my collaborators and I consider the possibility, it sounds like such a simple idea, that dark matter carries its own charge. So there's actually, we can call it dark light if you like. There's electromagnetism that dark matter experiences that ordinary matter does not experience, okay? If ordinary matter experienced, it would be ruled out. It would be much too strongly interacting with us. But if, if it's just dark matter that experiences it, what would be the constraints? Well, so there's several types of constraints if you look in the literature. And I'd argue that all of them were too strong. Um, one of them was the idea that if you look at halos um, of galaxies, Usually we think that they're roughly spherical, but there is some triaxiality. There's an argument in the literature that if there was interaction, if there was too strong an interaction, it would wash out the triaxiality. In particular, if you tried to have asymmetric velocity distributions that produced an elliptical structure, um, if you had too much interaction, it would just make it all isot isotropic and it would look spherical. So the idea was see seeing evidence of anisotropy was considered to be some, was considered to uh, seriously impinge on the parameter space. That's way too strong a constraint, the one that was derived, because you could have an isotropy not just because of velocities, um, because of other effects I'm going to talk about. Um, it turns out that ellipticity hasn't actually been well measured in most galaxies. The constraints from galaxy clusters are actually very weak on the interaction. The constraint from galaxy would be strong, but there was actually only one that was measured. And as I'll just show you in a minute, it, it actually matters how you get ellipticity as a function of radius. So that constraint is too strong. There's also a constraint from bullet cluster type things. Remember I said that the bullet cluster was this cluster of galaxies where you had dark, essentially clusters of galaxies merging, and you see gas get stuck at the center and dark matter go through. But to use that to put a constraint, you have to know what you started with. So there will eventually be a constraint, but if we don't know how much dark matter versus ordinary matter we started with, we don't know how much could have evaporated in the process and how much can get stuck in the middle. So it's very hard at this point, certainly based on one galaxy cluster, to put a constraint. Another really interesting constraint, which I think is going to actually give rise to some really interesting physics, had to do with a dwarf galaxy, a dwarf satellite galaxy, moving through the halo of a bigger galaxy. So the idea is you have a small galaxy that is orbiting a bigger galaxy. So both of those have their own dark matter. So the big galaxy has a dark matter halo. The small galaxy has dark matter as well as stars, the dwarf galaxy. Now the constraint was imposed by saying that if you have this dark matter in the dwarf galaxy, it will interact with the dark matter in the halo of the big galaxy and cause it to evaporate. Um, but that's way too simple, because really what happens is you also have interactions of the dark matter in the dwarf galaxy itself, which can actually just make it puff out. So it would certainly change the distribution of dwarf galaxies, but without knowing what you started with, and without doing a detailed study, and without knowing the orbit, the motion of these dwarfs through the halo, it's again very hard to impose a constraint. Although I do think, especially in light of these low surface brightness, these spread out galaxies that we're finding, there's a lot of really interesting things to be learned from the astrophysics that's, that's being done now. So again, I'm not saying that these cannot be used ever to put constraints or even to discover interactions, but we've got a lot of work ahead of us. So I'll just give you one small plot just to give you an idea of the kind of thing I'm talking about. So the ellipticity of galaxies turned out to be the strongest constraint that was existing in the literature. It turned out there was only one galaxy where they measured the ellipticity. But if you look at it, it matters quite a bit where you measure that ellipticity. Is it at the outer part of the dwarf galaxy or is it at the, of the galaxy or is it at the inner part? If it's at the inner part, um, it, it matters if it's at the outer part that you measure it, it matters because the density is so much smaller there that the kind of interactions that we're trying to constrain happen less often. 
On the other hand, if you try to measure ellipticity in the inner part, you get a much poorer measurement. So it's very hard to use the inner part of the galaxy. So if you actually look in detail at how this would be imposed, you find a much weaker constraint. That's just one example. And it's not even clear this is the right target. There's many reasons you can have ellipticity in galaxies. So it turns out, even if you took their assumptions to heart and just did it carefully, you would find that the constraint became a lot weaker. That yellow curve went to the blue curve. And that matters because if you ask for something with thermal relic abundance, that's the orange curve. In one case, it's rolled out. In one case, it's not rolled out. So what this is saying is that even, without, even if you believe this is the way to impose it, if you did it correctly, you can have dark matter that's basically T, you know, 100 GV and interacts with essentially electromagnetic strength. I mean, when I first started working on this, I thought that would have been crazy. I would have thought that would be really ruled out. I thought dark matter really doesn't interact a lot. But it turns out you can actually have these really interesting interactions for dark matter, and we still don't know about it. And so I'm not saying that they necessarily exist, but I really think, um, especially in light of the amazing amount of astrophysical data we're getting today, this is something we should take to heart and see what kind of constraints or discoveries we might actually make. Okay. So I conclude that this darkly charged dark matter, as we called it, is clearly viable. The constraints are considerably weaker than stated. Um, eventually, simulations will help, but I think there's a lot of really interesting theory work to be done. Um, and it's really a very interesting possibility that dark matter has its own world of interactions. I mean, this is about the simplest thing you could have done, right? I just said that there's just a U1, just a photon. But of course, there could be lots of interesting interactions in the dark sector, just like there are in the standard model. I mean, after all, the standard model is really complex. We have diff three different forces. We have different particles that experience the forces differently. Uh, we don't yet know whether or not that's true in the dark sector, too. Um, this is a somewhat more technical slide, but it's kind of pretty amazing. So I'm just going to tell you why I found this interesting. So in fact, what happened was we actually, because we found that the constraints were so much weaker, we actually kind of introduced a new regime of interactions, which is somewhat strongly interacting if you have small velocities. Because we were looking at a photon exchange. A photon exchange gives rise to interactions that go like one over velocity to the fourth power, which means if you have slowly moving systems, they're much more strongly interacting. And in particular, in the core of dwarf galaxies, you have slowly, or in the center of dwarf galaxies, you have slowly moving stars, and we thought, this might get ruled out because you would just get so much interaction according to this new allowed parameter regime that just the, you would just have the whole thing be cored and you'd just get rid of all the structure in the dwarf. But it turns out there's something called a Knudsen number, which for some reason I find really funny. It has KN as the symbol. And it turns out there's essentially a leading order, a duality between really strongly interacting um, things and really weakly interacting things. So essentially the Knudsen number is sort of the interaction length versus the size of the object. And once, so that could be less than one or bigger than one. So it could be that your free streaming length exceeds the size of the object or it doesn't. And it turns out that if something is so strongly interacting, it just can't transfer in energy efficiently. So if you end up in a really high or low Knudsen number regime, I forgot how it's defined, um, it could be so strongly interacting that it just doesn't do that much after all. So I think this is, again, a really interesting regime to study to understand this duality better and to understand how we can go beyond that and see what, what really happens in this strongly interacting regime. OK. So that's all I'm going to say about just interacting dark matter where everything is darkly charged. The, I actually, the first thing I had worked on um, was actually something called, we called partially interacting dark matter. And this was with Matt Reese, G.G. Fan, and Andre Katz. So we worked on partially interacting dark matter, which again, it seems like such an obvious possibility, but somehow was really not being considered. So, we said, so at that point, we actually did think the constraints were pretty strong. And in this case, actually, if you have a light particle, they are strong for cosmological reasons that I haven't gone into. But we said, but even if you assume the constraints are really strong, What's to stop you from having some small fraction of the dark matter that interacts? So rather than have all of the dark matter interact, maybe some small fraction of the dark matter interacts. Now, 
you know, you might say, well, who cares? It's only a fraction of the dark matter. But by that logic, you'd say, why do you care about baryons? In other words, standard model particles. After all, the energy baryons carry is also only a small fraction of the energy carried by dark matter. But the reason we care about it is because it has all these other interactions, which is why it gives rise to the structure that we see. So if you're out in the halo, you know, you're dark matter dominated, but we live here in the, in the galactic disk, which is dominated by ordinary matter. And the reason we have the galactic disk is because ordinary matter has interactions with electromagnetism, which allow it to cool and collapse. So if you have matter that interacts, even if it's only a small fraction, it potentially gives rise to observable consequences. And that's why it's interesting. Because, you know, again, we might be in a situation, and it looks like we're heading there, it may or may not turn out to be the case, that dark matter really doesn't have a whole lot of interaction with ordinary matter. In which case, you want to see what you can learn about it. And it might be that we won't be able to probe the bulk of the dark matter, and maybe it is just an interacting fraction. So in any case, it's interesting to ask what kind of tests we can have for this interacting fraction of dark matter. Because after all, again, we're getting all this astronomical data, so let's just get the most out of it and see if we could either discover or put constraints on some interacting fraction because it does have observable consequences. So I think it should be clear that for the types of constraints I talked about already, if it's only a fraction, it's not going to have a big effect. But the question is, what are the other things you might hope to see if you have a fraction of the dark matter interacting? Okay. So again, just to be clear, we're considering dark matter with its own force, but we're not assuming it's all of the dark matter, we're assuming it's only a fraction, just like baryons. Now, why is it interesting? Well, baryons are interesting because they're denser, for one thing, because we have this galactic disk where we have baryons. If we did, had not had electromagnetic radiation that allowed baryons to collapse into the disk, they would, actually wouldn't be all that interesting. The reason we're here is because we were able to form structure because we got denser ordinary matter. And that happened because of the interactions. So maybe, again, we have some component of dark matter that does something similar. So not only is it interacting, but I'm assuming, or going to test for a model where, like baryons, it's also dissipative, where it also interacts with radiation that allows it to cool. And by cooling, it can collapse into a dark disk, just like ordinary matter collapses into the galactic disk. Okay. So, if it, so now there's an additional assumption. So on the one hand, I'm not assuming it's all of the dark matter, but on the other hand, I'm assuming that it's dissipative. And, it, and that leads to rethinking, I'm going to say, as we'll see, of almost all measurements that we do. And since we don't know what dark matter is, we should really keep an open mind and especially in light of the abundance of astronomical data. And I think hope, my hope is also that this will sort of guide the data collection in the future. Okay. So we're going to ask the question, could interacting dark matter cool into a dark matter disk? Again, just like the disk of the Milky Way. So to generate a disk, you have to cool. So what happens is, with ordinary matter, is that it cools down, and by cooling down, it collapses. And it collapses into a disk rather than a ball because angular momentum is conserved. And that's why you get this rotating disk. Okay. But to do that, you need not just the interaction, you need something light enough that the radiation is a big enough effect. So in the case of the standard model, it's not just that there's radiation, it's that there's protons and electrons. Without electrons, protons would not have collapsed into a disk in the lifetime of the universe. It's the electrons that interact enough to cool because the, in, it, the interaction is inversely proportional to a power of their mass. And, and then the electrons interact with protons, which allows the disks to form. So the dark disk, too, is formed because we have a means of dissipating energy. So we have this darkly charged dark matter, but we're also going to have to have something light, like an electron. So this model is very uncreative. Basically what we're doing is we're just sort of copying the standard model and, and the very simple part of it. So just like in the standard theory, you have a proton, an electron, and a photon, which is really to first approximation what you need to consider the astrophysics. 
In this case, we have a dark matter particle that's heavier, maybe 100 GeV, 100 times the proton mass. We have a particle we call a coolant, uh, C, so say another fermion, C, and we have a dark photon. So it's really, so it's very uncreative. We just said, how does the standard theory work? Maybe the dark sector is doing the same thing. So we have oppositely charged, just like proton and electron are oppositely charged, we have dark matter particle and a coolant that are oppositely charged. Of course, you can complicate this model if you want to. You can add all the nuclear forces, et cetera. But let's start by considering the simplest possibility, because that's, we don't want to get overly complicated while we're putting out constraints. And we can move on and then try to consider more interesting, even more complex possibilities. OK. OK. Skip that. So then you can ask, for what range of parameters would you cool into a disk? So I'm not going to expect you to look at this plot, these plots in detail. But I will tell you the upshot of the answer, which is not very surprising, which is that you find that the charge has to be somewhat comparable to the electromagnetic charge. If it was way too, too small, you would overclose the universe. Um, and, so you need, and you need it to be big enough to actually radiate. And the particle mass, and this I hadn't actually known before I started working on this. Um, Matt Reese was a collaborator, so it's appropriate he's online. Um, but uh, but, um, but um, you, you actually need the particle to be not that much heavier than the electron. If you have something that's, that's a proton mass, it would never radiate in time. So you, so you do need an additional assumption in addition to the fact that there is a dark photon. You also need to have a slightly more complex dark sector with a heavier particle and a lighter particle. Okay? And, and then if you have that, then you would get cooling. So you basically have alpha of the dark sector comparable to alpha in our sector, which is a pretty natural value. You would have a mass of a particle in the dark sector comparable to the mass of the electron, which isn't necessarily a very natural value, but that's what you need. Okay. Now, another thing that's very interesting about that, though, is that if that's the case, then the binding energy in the two sectors would also be comparable. And the binding energy is essentially setting the temperature at which the cooling stops. Um, that's actually just a first approximation. There are cooling processes that continue. But the bremsstrahlung strahlung radiation, the inverse Compton cooling, that determine the disk to first approximation would stop once you uh, combine into atoms. So again, this is somewhat complicated looking slide. I'm not going to go through the details. It's not actually that complicated. But here's the idea of what I want to say here. Suppose you accept what I just said, that alpha squared Alpha is comparable to alpha in the ordinary sector. Alpha dark matter is comparable to alpha in the, in the ordinary sector. That is to say the charges are comparable. And the mass of the coolant is comparable to the mass of the electron. In other words, the binding energies are comparable. That would tell you that the temperature at which cooling stops is comparable in both sectors. But here's the thing. If the dark sector has a heavier mass dark matter particle than a proton, say 100 GeV versus proton mass of 1 GeV, then MV squared, which is comparable to the temperature, is comparable. So if you have a heavier mass, you have a smaller velocity. And if you have a smaller velocity, you have a thinner disk. And because it's actually related to the density, it turns out that the thickness of the disk in this simple approximation scales like 1 over m. So the upshot is that not only could you form a dark disk, but if the dark matter particle is heavier, you might hope to see a thinner dark disk embedded in the disk of the Milky Way. And I say embedded because there are interact because gravitational interaction would tend to make them one of a line. Okay. So it's a really simple model. There's a heavy component, um, simple a, a light component, photon, um, and we expect a dark disk even narrower than the gaseous disk. OK. So this is really interesting, because maybe, so again, I said there's a small fraction of dark matter. And there probably is a very small fraction. But if this is the case, it could be even denser um, with respect to the disk of our galaxy that was tilted, but forget that. Um, so you could have something that's a small fraction, but is even denser than ordinary matter in, our, in, the, in the disk. 
And so even though it's a subdominant component, it's something that we could hope to see. Um, so, and it has some really interesting consequences. And so some of them relate to um, observations that are being done here. But one of the most obvious things it would do is it would affect the motion of stars in the Milky Way. In particular, if we think about the vertical motion of stars in the Milky Way, if we have a dense dark matter disk embedded in the ordinary disk, it would affect the, the relationship between density and velocity of stars through the Jeans and Boltzmann equation. And you can solve that. And you can, you can use that to actually look for this dark disk. So at the time we wrote this, uh, Gaia data didn't exist. Um, so we used Treparkless data to study it. Um, and right now, people are redoing this analysis with Gaia data. Um, but I'm going to skip that. Um, and this is what we call the bound from structure. And Eric Kramer um, did a lot of work on this. Um, so again, the idea is to measure the dark disk through looking at the velocities of stars. And this is, I think this is a really nice example of why you want to have models in mind. Because this data existed. People even sort of put constraints on dark disks, but they didn't necessarily do it right. Why is that? Well, one thing is, what you learn from having an actual model is that the thickness of the disk is not necessarily related to the thickness of the gaseous disk. So before, most of the time when constraints were imposed, they were imposed by assuming it was, it was comparable thickness. So even just knowing of this model just tells you you should be doing it as a function not just of surface density, but of surface density and thickness. Another reason that it's really important to have a model in mind is we're dealing with gravity. So if you have a dark disk, it actually changes the structure of the other disks which respond. So it would change the relationship, say, between the midplane density and the surface density. Because you would actually, if the dark disk would actually pinch the ordinary matter. So it would change the distribution. So if you didn't put it in from the beginning, um, you wouldn't know that. So it also gives you a way to sort of target it. And this is something I think people who do particle physics know very well. You can be looking for really small effects. Um, if you don't know what you're looking for, you generally don't find it. But if you have some target, you can then put a very strict bound because you know exactly what you're looking for. And I'm not saying that you want to find, I mean, this is not something, you know, with these philosophers get upset because you're, you, know, you find the things you're looking for. It's just it tells you more, in a more direct way how to distinguish the properties of something new from something that would be there anyway. And so at the time we wrote this, there were just blithe statements in the literature, like the dark disk is ruled out. I mean, first of all, that doesn't even make sense, because you could always make the dark disk as low in density as you want, and then it would still be allowed. So the best you could do ever is put a constraint. But on top of that, the, the analyses basically what they amounted to is, we could sort of fit it with standard stuff. So we don't, there's no need for a dark disk. But you know, by that logic, you, know, you probably wouldn't have found the Higgs boson, because you wouldn't have known to look for this thing that was you know, one out of a billion. I mean, the fact is that it could fit without things, but the question is, is there something interesting lurking in the areas? And eventually, can you pull it out? So we redid the analysis that Flynn and Holberg did on the Hipparchus data, and we also found some pretty interesting stuff. Um, um, we found, in particular, we found that the distribution of tracer stars that was being used wasn't actually in equilibrium, or at least it didn't look like in equilibrium. So a really interesting question this brings to mind is exactly uh, where the sun is in relation to the midplane of the disk. Because it matters, and it matters if it's moving, if the stars are moving with respect to the sun. And so this is something I'm really hoping will get understood better by looking at the Gaia data. And again, I think it introduces this interesting question that there hadn't been enough attention to, like how these, how these star populations are moving and where they're, where they're centered. Okay. So the general lesson, I'd say, is that there's a role for this particle physics approach in astronomy. Um, the constraint came from sort of fitting the standard component, but it turns out the errors weren't properly accounted for. And you have to do it self-consistently. So you have these big, messy data sets, so targeting the model certainly helps. Okay. And I'm not going to go through all these other details. But I will say that when we get the Gaia data, we'll have a better idea of what the constraints are on this dark disk. Okay. I'm just going to mention a couple of other things, in part because they're things people are thinking about. But I think it's really nice to also see some of the other implications that you would have if you have this dark matter disk. Okay. One of them has to do with um, the satellites of the Andromeda galaxy. It turns out that 
if you look at the satellites in the Andromeda galaxy, again, we're talking about the dwarf galaxies that are orbiting around, you might naively expect them to be isotropically distributed. But it turns out there's a vast plane of satellites. Um, you know, there's a few things that people look to when they want to look for um, deviations from cold dark matter. Um, people talk about core cusp problem and too big to fail and um, missing satellites. But this is also something that might potentially be really interesting if it, if it holds up. If you look at the satellites of the Andromeda galaxy, almost half of them seem to be orbiting in a big plane. Um, not only are, most, are they orbiting in this big plane, 13 out of 15 of them are orbiting in the same direction. And that is, seems statistically unlikely. So why is this? Well, it could be something that follows from dark matter, although I haven't, a standard cold dark matter mall, although I haven't seen any convincing explanation of why that would be. The other thing that's interesting about them is that they might be dark matter dominated. We don't know that for sure yet, and hopefully that will get settled eventually. Now, why is all of this interesting for our model? Well, imagine that it's true. Probably the most compelling explanation for how this happened is that the Andromeda was formed from the merging of other galaxies. And there were tidal forces that pulled stuff out of the disk of one of the galaxies that eventually became these satellites. And that would explain why they're all in the same plane and why they're all rotating together. Now, what would not explain in the standard theory would be how you would get dark matter in there. Because if you're just pulling stuff out of the disk of the galaxy, that would be ordinary matter. And it certainly wouldn't explain how it could be dark matter dominated. So if it turns out these satellites are indeed dark matter dominated, this is very compelling from the point of view of this model. Why is that? Well, first of all, we have dark matter in the disk, which usually is not the case, or at least it's very, very little in the standard halo, cold dark model model. And furthermore, the dark matter that is in the disk is moving more slowly. And if it's moving more slowly, it means that when it gets pulled out, it's more likely to get bound into these dwarf galaxies. So you can show that for the kind of parameters we did, you can end up with ranges of dark matter to ordinary matter that's very comparable to the things that are so far claimed. But of course, this is going to rely on measurements really pinning this down. But this could be a very interesting way to search for this sort of model if it turns out to hold up. Another thing that's really interesting um, that my students have been looking at are sort of dwarf galaxy shapes. Um, you know, I talked about the Milky Way having a disk, but dwarf galaxies might have some sort of structure too. And in any case, it motivates other ways to actually test whether the cold dark matter model is right. And in particular, one question that my student Linda Hu is asking is, when you look at these dwarf galaxies that are elliptical, we talk about dwarf toroidals, but there's dwarf ellipticals, are they oblate or prolate? If you look at simulations, they're mostly prolate, that is to say cigar-shaped. But maybe they're oblate. So now, of course, if you're only looking at projections, eventually you'd like to measure 3D velocities. But if you're only looking at projections, you don't know that. You only have the line of sight velocities. However, you can try to do some proxy for it. And in particular, she looked at the proxy being correlation between mass and surface density. So if you looked at surface density, if you have the same mass, um, you would see a different brightness, surface brightness if it's oblate, where it goes through something thin, or prolate, where it's going through something thick. So she looked at divided into small mass to light and large mass to light ratio, and really saw that for the large mass to light, it looks like, at least according to current data, again, data will improve, it looks more oblate. But according to simulations, it looks more prolate. So again, I don't know if this will hold up, but I think it's a really interesting thing to look at. And Sasha actually just looked at self consistently by looking at the details of a particular galaxy, um, how well it fits the standard theory, by using the dark matter to determine the distribution of stars. So I think this is going to, you know, as we get more data, these kind of tests are going to be really important in testing the consistency of cold dark matter models. And the final thing, uh, which I'll just mention briefly, because it's what gave rise to the title of my book, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, was a very speculative possibility. But it does give a target for what we'd like the surface density and thickness of the disk to be, to at least match this particular observation. Um, so if you look at the meteorite database, I think that number should be more like 25 craters bigger than 20 kilometers in circumference in the last 250 years, 50 million years. That is to say, you can go to the Earth Impact Database, which is on the web, and you can find out all the big craters 
that there are on the Earth. And big impact craters, craters that correspond to something that actually hit the Earth. Um, so 20 kilometers is interesting because it's something that's formed by an object about a kilometer in size or bigger. So these are really big objects that have hit the Earth and could potentially do a lot of damage. In particular, the one that hit um, 66 million years ago did do a lot of damage and caused a major mass extinction. And that was the extinction, including the extinction of the dinosaurs. It's known as the KPG extinction. And um, the story of that um, discovery is in itself really interesting and was pretty exciting science that I got to learn more about in writing the book. But the idea that um, it could be this impact from, outer, from space, not outer space, but from space of an object hitting the Earth that actually caused this extinction is pretty amazing. And the fact is that not only did they show a lot of evidence that it was something that hit, but they found the actual crater so they could test the timing and really see that it was this object that it hit that gave rise to this extinction. So it's pretty amazing. But if you actually look at the evidence, if you look at just the data on, forget about extinctions, but if you just look at the data on these craters, there's some marginal evidence for periodicity of about 30 to 35 million years. And it is marginal. And when we started working on this, geologists were very unhappy. They really want to bury this and never think about it again. But the fact is, it's not clear whether these are happening on a somewhat periodic basis or whether it's happening at some regular rate. And the reason it's not clear is that there's just not enough craters. I mean, there's nothing we can do about that right now. I mean, they happen only every 30 to 35 million years. Um, most of them fall into the ocean. Some of them don't, you know, we don't have the evidence. So the fact that there's as many as around 25 that have been identified on the surface of the Earth is in itself kind of incredible. But, um, but, but there really was, you know, we were reading the papers and they would, you know, one paper would say this is, there's evidence, one paper would say there wasn't. And so we eventually kind of pinned down some of the sources. I mean, one of the reasons is that, you know, they're defined differently. So people use different sizes. Another is that people um, look at different time frames. But one of the big reasons for the difference was something that we, as particle physicists, called the look elsewhere effect. You know, there's many possible periodicities. So if you take that into account, you're more likely to find something that, that matches because if you allow yourself that possibility. So another advantage of actually having a model is that we get rid of a lot of that because we actually have a model so we can actually say what the motion would be. So these people didn't have a model, they just fit it to a sine curve and they said, does it work or not? But in our case, we actually know what the motion would be in the presence of a disk with particular parameters. And we can, and if we say that the likelihood that you cause an impact is related to the density that it's passing through, you can say something. Now, I haven't said why it should be related to the density of what it's passing through. Why do we care that it's passing through the disk? So the idea is, I should, let me back up a little bit. The idea, the idea of possible explanation for periodicity is that the solar system, as it's going around in the galaxy, goes up and down through the plane of the galaxy. And suppose it went through the plane every 30 to 35 million years. Okay, at those times it's gonna see enhanced density, which means it would see enhanced tidal forces. There's something called the Oort cloud, which are objects that are you know, thousands of times farther away from the sun than the Earth. And those are bound to the sun, but they're weakly bound because they're really far away. So the idea is that if you had some small kick on those objects, they could be ejected from the solar system altogether, or maybe they'd come, they're more likely to get out of their orbit and come towards Earth. So the idea is that, they're more, that the ejection probability should be proportional to the density. So if you had this very sudden change in density as you went through a dark matter disk, it could actually give you this periodic ejection of stuff from the Oort cloud that could explain this periodicity. So now we have a specific model, and we don't know the parameters, but we could fit for what the thickness and density would have to be in order to match the model, and that's what we did. And so the, again, the idea is that you can fit this, and if you look at what the parameters are, you find that you get a pretty definite prediction for the dark matter surface density. This was, however, based on some kind of poor modeling of the baryonic disk my student Eric Kramer and another student Ronan um, redid the analysis and they found even better kinds of matching to, to the 66 million year ago extinction, but also just showed how it would match. And they took into account things like the spiral arms. They really did a more detailed analysis of how stuff passed through. But the upshot is that you get a surface density roughly 
10 solar masses per parsec squared, and you need a thickness of the order of, I don't know, maybe 30 parsecs. So, so do we know that, um, yeah, so the scale height is around 10 to 20, 30 parsecs. So this gives you a target. I mean, the dark disk could have any parameters, but if it's going to fit this particular phenomenon, that's what you'd want to look for, and that's one of the targets that people have used when they looked at Hipparchos and now Gaia data. So um, it's pretty fun. I mean, whether or not this is true, I don't know, but it's kind of nice to have a target to look for. So clearly this is a big problem pr program. Dark matter charge is clearly a possibility, and there are many implications. Um, but I'd say that they're more subtle than people have, and have, have worked out, and a lot of theoretical and observational work is still to be done. But we want to be able to figure out what this data means. So for the future, there's a lot of things to be done. Um, you know, we want to really use Gaia to get the better kinematics. So I just conclude by saying that this is clearly a critical time for dark matter searches. I think we're reaching the end of the line, sort of direct searches, but the next decade will basically figure out whether WIMPs are a reasonable possibility or not. But we're getting also the convergence of large data sets and numerical methods, and it's, but it's important to have targets, because um, it's not always obvious um, what the things are. So you might stumble into something, or you can do a more dark d targeted search, like particle physicists do. So I think this is real, some really interesting physics, and in some ways, we're just getting started. So thank you. Not flattened. They're, they're not flattened. They're, they're round. Right. Dark matter potentials. Uh, now, let's say that every disk had a dark disk. They would be too very unstable to bar formation. If it's so too thin. Every disk that we observe should, in principle, have a bar. Also, there's a lot of constraints on the dark matter and the galactic bulge. And there essentially is no, I'm sorry to point these three things out at once, but there's no dark matter. In the galactic okay. Very analysis for that. Okay, so let's do them one. Okay, so let's do it one at a time. Okay. okay. So the first thing is galaxy clusters, right? Okay. So the first thing was galaxy clusters. I just can't hear him very well. So the first was galaxy clusters, right? So galaxy clusters could be formed from first of all in galaxy clusters. It's not clear how much uh, disk structure there is. It's OK. This is fine. OK, I'm talking now. When he talks, I'll move over. OK, so um, it, it's not clear how much structure there is in the galaxy clusters. And, um, and especially if you have merging of stuff, then stuff gets excited and it all gets kicked around just the way there's not that much evidence for ordinary disks in galaxy clusters. So I'm not really worried about galaxy clusters. We'd have to know a lot more. OK, the second thing was what? Yeah, so tumor instability, okay, so again, you, you do have to worry about that. We have looked at that. So some of them would be tumor instables, and, some, and if it's thick enough, it won't be. I mean, there's, you know, it depends on the surface density and, and the stuff around it and how thick it is. I mean, and you can also imagine that there are other interactions. So we, we did a very simple analysis where we just had this one thing, and you, can fig, and you can work out for which thickness it would be tumor instable. And it turns out it was about 30 parsecs in the case of this kind of disk. And, your, and the third thing was your model would predict a great deal of dark matter in the galactic bulge. So that's actually so not obvious. Disk, which yeah. would be a dark disk, which would dominate the visible disk, which would then imply very So that's dark. also not entirely obvious. And, so, and I'm not saying this will necessarily work, but it, it depends how stuff is um, going towards the center. I mean, the bulge is probably associated with the fact that you also have the spiral arms, and so stuff has gone through into conserve angular momentum. You're sort of compensating. And so it's not, the dynamics of this dark disk are not entirely obvious. And I want to say that um, part of me is just, I mean, so for the things that are hard and require simulations, or they, we could do simulations, or we could also just keep an open mind and do observations. Because 
even though the simple, even if it was true that the simple model that would happen, you could imagine adding other in interactions where that doesn't happen. So I still think it's an interesting question to ask that. But um, it's not obvious to me that the bulge would form, especially since we don't actually know exactly how this bulge formed in the first place. We do, because it was formed from a massive disk which made a bar. There's really strong evidence for this. Yeah, but that comes from stuff flowing in towards the center and then stuff flowing out, right? So it's compensating the momentum. Okay, let me, uh, let's talk about it, okay. There's wine and cheese afterwards. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about mega parsec scale effects of dissipation? Say there's a fraction of dark matter that's dissipating rapidly to show you get a 10 parsec to the scale that you show. What impact does that fraction have on supernova? Yeah, so on large scales, it has really little effect as far as we know. I mean, um, again, a lot, of, a lot of the ways to consider the interactions is just looking at the individual interactions, one over V to the fourth. So it's a question of how fast stuff is moving, and it's also a question of whether it's ionized. So a lot of the stuff you're talking about is no longer ionized anyway, but if it is, then you'd have to look at the velocities and just see how strong an effect it is. So that's why, in general, it's the smaller scales where it has a bigger effect. It doesn't necessarily talk to the standard model at all. I mean, we did consider the possibility that it talks to the standard model, and then in which case, maybe it's part of what's giving rise to this GV excess at the center, and you could have small objects that are actually compact objects that do that. But that requires some additional model building, where you'd have to have, um, it, actually, you one can't mix, because if it did, then you'd be ruled out by the number of degrees of freedom, so you need a slightly more complicated model with a photon and a Z. So to first approximation, we assumed it didn't interact directly, but you can consider this possibility. But you need to give mass somehow to those fields, right? You need to give mass to those particles somehow. Yes. So you need more dark particles than just those ones, right? Well, first of all, they don't even necessarily have to be fermions. But second of all, it's not hard to do that, and we can talk about how, to, yeah. yeah. But you're right, to get a complete model, you'd want to have all of those things. So why, why would you expect the uh, angular momentum of the dark matter to line up with the angular momentum of ordinary matter? Sorry, I just, sorry, I just want to say one more thing. I mean, you could just imagine that they're vector-like particles, but there's just an asymmetry of matter over antimatter. So that's what forms it. But okay, go so ahead. I understood mean, correctly, you lined up the angular momentum so the disks line well, up. Well, the gravi gravity would want them to line up, because if they weren't, then gravity would try to pull them together. So you could just do a simple estimate to see that, yeah. And it lowers, lowers its energy when they're aligned. <laughs>